we're good.
live stream will go live uh, starting at 7 p.m., so in about 10 minutes. So please make sure you have your cell phones off. Um, and please try not to leave during the session itself. These doors are very large and unwieldy and noisy, so it would be great if you could stay put. Um, our last thing is that during the session, we're going to be having a moderated Q&A here, up here, and also some Twitter Q&A. Um, but you will have a chance to check in with our amazing speaker, Assemblyman Blake. After the session, he'll be doing an in-person Q&A. So don't worry, your questions will be answered as well. Thank you again so much for joining us, and we will go live in just a few minutes. Welcome. It from you. Yeah, we're good. That's why, I That's why we came here. That's why we came here. So can you check again? Hey, check one, two. Hello. Good afternoon. Good morning. So, good night. All right. Okay. So just. Okay. So that's we are now. You can turn on without any conversation. If you whisper or something, it'll mic. She'll be next to me, right? So she can turn on. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. That's right. Yeah. Okay. She's perfect. All right. Hey guys, there's kids here. She got my son. We got a buddy. That's all right. Hi. Thank you. Sorry to be derobing you. There's, there's, there's no. There's just a lot of, there's, there's no, it's all shame. It's all just, there's no privacy. There's no agency. Okay, so I am, we are not in a cutaway shot sitting here. Okay. I'm with Monica just...
I have two minutes just to pace in the hallway for a second? Yeah, go ahead. All right. Right, um, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? So no. Blessing to see you. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a few people who have... ...before I start a conversation with Michael. To say thank you for Creed's curriculum and his community. Oh, I'm, I'm going to try to say something right now. Bless you now.
welcome everyone to the fourth session of our first semester of Resistance School. It has been a truly amazing month. We opened our first session reflecting on the despair we felt back in November. We open our session tonight feeling profoundly energized by what we've embarked upon with all of you over these last few weeks. Our first semester of Resistance School has shown us what it looks like to start translating our shared values into collective action. We began with Timothy McCarthy's foundational lessons on communication for political advocacy, urging us to look inward and to identify what drives our own desire to enact change. Next, we move to Sarah el -Amin, who showcased the urgency of organizing our communities now in order to mobilize more effectively in the future. And last week's session put its own vision into action when Marshall Gans and his vivacious team led us through the key steps for launching our own teams. Tonight, we are honored to be joined by New York State Assemblyman and Vice Chair of the Democratic National Committee, Michael Blake. <laughs> Assemblyman Blake will give us an inside look at exactly what kinds of coalitions we need to turn this moment into a movement. Now, you may have noticed that we've been mentioning first semester quite a bit. We are thrilled to announce that semester two of Resistance School is officially in the works. Yes. <laughs> we'll tell you more about that later tonight, but please be sure to sign up on our email list on our website to get all of the details. We can't wait to hear from all of you about how your first semester went and to begin building the training content that is right for you and your community. After Assemblyman Blake's presentation, we have another special surprise. In addition to fielding questions from all of you via Twitter, we have a special guest with us here tonight, Megan Stone, who will lead us through a conversation with Assemblyman Blake. Megan is the former president of the Malala Fund, where she served with founder and Nobel Peace Prize laureate Malala Yousafzai to empower girls globally to learn and lead without fear. We are so excited to have this dynamic duo here with us this evening, and we encourage you to send your questions for them our way. As always, feel free to tweet us at at resist underscore school. And just one quick final note, Resistance School is an independently organized project developed by students at Harvard University. It is not an official course or offering of Harvard University or any of its schools. <laughs> Assemblyman Blake, thank you so much for joining us here at Resistance School. Enjoy. Hello. Hello. How we doing today? Fine. How we doing tonight? Yeah. There we go. Now, now we're in business. Woo, that's good. That's good. We like that good energy. Before uh, we even uh, go any further, I, I want to say thank you for, for having me, but uh, I, I have to do justice where justice is due because we have a titan in the movement uh, who has been an incredible leader uh, for, for years, who is in the room, uh, who says a nation that does not stand for children, does not stand for anything. And so we have to recognize her because she's here, Marion Wright Edelman, who is here with us on tonight. Thank you. 
I now can visit my family in Cleveland because I've taken care of that right there, right? You know, uh, in, in, that, in that way and in that manner. Uh, for those I'm, I'm meeting for the first time, my name is Michael Blake. I'm an assembly member uh, for the South Bronx, South South Bronx. For any of you who know hip hop, you'll understand what I'm saying right there. Uh, and, and also a, a vice chair for the DNC, uh, recently uh, elected. We're excited. Uh, on having this, this conversation. And the, the main piece I'm gonna keep talking through is how do you sustain the resistance? You know, because it, it's not just about having one day of, of activity and success, but how do you keep going uh, in that way? I also have to say that yes, while I am a Democrat, I'm wearing red today because today would have been my daddy's 83rd birthday. His favorite color was red. Uh, but in, in, a, in a sign of being bipartisan, I have blue socks on. So, you know, we gotta go, you know, we got it all going in that manner, you know, to keep it all going. Uh, in that way. So let's see how we're how we doing here. All right. Can we have some fun? Yeah. All right. So the, 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 there's many things we want to talk through on uh, tonight. And of course, uh, we want to keep amplifying the, the importance of this. And, and how do we ensure that we go not just from a moment, but to a movement? You know, there's a lot of successes you can have along the way. Uh, but you can't have a resistance if you're just resisting one time. Right? You, know, you, you can't talk about having progress if you're just showing up one day uh, of the week. And you have to recognize that there's going to be a lot of victories that happen along the way. When we were with uh, then Senator Obama on the first campaign uh, and we had won 12 uh, primaries and caucuses in a row, uh, I remember several of us we were with him on the elevator. And we said, boss, why are you not more excited? We have a lot of momentum going right now. And he said, you know, to, to quote Magic Johnson, uh, I'm not here for conference championships, I'm here for titles. <laughs> and, and the point he was trying to make is, you, you can't just get excited about one victory. You know, you, you can't just say, I'm just gonna have success today, how do I keep building upon it? But also understanding that if you wanna have true success, you have to understand that it's not just about marching one time, right? You know, you have to, keep marching. It's not about organizing one time. You have to keep organizing. You can't just have positive legislation for one day. You have to keep being engaged in that way. So the intent of tonight is to talk through very clear metrics and, and, and ideas and how we build uh, accordingly and respectively. And, and allow me to start with a few kind of top line points that goes through our mind. First, when we talk about how to sustain yourself, find your why. That's the first piece. Find your why. You know, why do you do this? You know, because you are going to be disappointed along the way. Uh, you, know, you know, we got some church folk in here. I like that right now, right? <laughs> you know, you, you're, you're going to have moments where you are disappointed, where you're frustrated, where you're upset. Uh, but, you know, David Seamus would tell us this all the time. Find your why. So if I'm trying to underscore, underscore the impact of whether it be the Women's March or economic justice or education, there has to be something deeper for me. So one of the many reasons I have such great appreciation for all the work uh, that has happened for Children's Defense Fund and so many others, uh, some of you might have heard of a book from Jonathan Kozel, Savage and Equality Children American Schools. That was my elementary school. Um, I was there at that time. James Carter was my principal. You know, so when, when we have conversations about education, it's not a theoretical conversation for me. You know, and so find your why of why you're trying to do this in this manner. Se secondly, is the rule of the five Ps, and that's how we're going to set the course on all of this. The proper preparation prevents poor performance. You know, proper preparation prevents poor performance. You know, you can talk a good game about being a part of a movement, but you have to be detailed, and you have to be organized, and you have to think through the tactics of it all uh, in, that, in that manner, and, and underscoring where you're trying to go uh, and mobilizing in that way and in this respective way. So when we think about movements, it's, it's also important to recognize that I understand we have a lot of different energy that's happening right now, but we are not the first, nor will we be the last movement. You know, so, sometimes we wanna have pride of ownership as if we were the first one to organize, we're not. Uh, but that's an exciting reality because you can understand and underscore the respective impact that happens. You know, for, uh, a brief anecdote of, of why this is relevant. I, I was able to build a very close relationship before she passed with Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, uh, a titan uh, that never really got the credit that was deserved in terms of some of the impact that she had uh, in many ways, especially as around the march uh, on Washington. Because if you know the full history, there were people that were trying to have Martin give a shorter speech. 
and they were equally not wanting him to be the last speaker. And she kept saying he needs to give the speech and he needs to be the last speaker and be able to engage in this way. And 45 years to the day, then you have you know, Barack Obama becoming the nominee. And I, and I say that to say, whenever I would be thinking about how to organize my first few years at the White House, I would regularly ask Dr. Height, how should we be doing this? Because what we can't do is just presume because we're part of a resistance right now that we're the first resistors. Everybody still with me? Right. It's, and it's, it's asking what worked and what didn't work. You, you have to have a, a, a recognition that you can't be too prideful to ask what works, <laughs> what happened, how do you mobilize? And when I go back, the reason why I started with Find Your Why, a lot of times people forget when you talk about the march uh, itself, it, it, was, it was a march for jobs and for freedom and economic justice. And when you think about Dr. King, you, know, you can't just cite Dr. King and forget why was he in Memphis? They were fighting for sanitation workers. There was an economic conversation that was happening in that way. And so we start by saying, where are we going in terms of being impactful uh, and, and giving a clear discourse of what we're trying to do? So what are we trying to do? We want to talk about the words that President Clinton shared at a speech I heard him convey in 2003, which really resonated with me that I think in a lot of ways can resonate in how to move, move forward. Shared values, shared responsibilities, shared benefits. You know, if, if you want to be able to sustain a movement, you can't do it alone. It is impossible to have success individually. Uh, when you think about all the different aspects that happen with a team, you know, for, for any of you that are uh, watching the playoffs and my, my love for the resistance school means that I'm missing the Rangers game tonight. You know, it's really difficult for me. You know, brothers do like hockey. I'm just trying to let you know that right now, right? You know, so you understand that it, it's tough to, to engage, but the only way to be successful in competition and in life is having multiple parts of that. And so when we think about how do I want to have success, I need to figure out what's first our shared value. Before I even get to the tactic, before I even get to the, the, the process, what is uniting us for a deeper cause? You know, if you look at, you know, uh, John Delavope, who's at your IOP Institute of Politics and the polling that they've been doing recently, uh, some of the recent polling they talked about is that people want to be united, but there's a lot of conversation around economic justice and economic unity that happens there. People want to feel that connection. But if you want to sustain a movement, then you have to have a conversation of what are our shared responsibilities that we have to have. And you can't just say, well, you know what, I'm just going to show up for the march and be ready to march. Well, you know, what were you doing before that happened? How were you engaging throughout? You know, when you think about people didn't just were able to show up for the women's march. And when you see uh, the pipe and the gates that were there, who was making the phone calls to the police department? <laughs> Who was mapping out the route? Who was making sure that there was food and water along the way? What were we thinking about? And when you think about one of the reasons why the Women's March was so successful is they weren't just thinking about one day. It was, what are we doing for the first 100 days? And what are our 10 steps and 10 actions that are going along that way? And we're going to dive into that uh, a little bit. And then the shared benefits. If you're able to have the conversation of how do we have this understanding, that's how you're able to take the resistance to the next level. And when you think about some of the, the recent examples itself, we can talk this through. So the Women's March, which we talked about uh, uh, briefly, when you think about how of the, the time 100, four of uh, the organizers for the Women's March were recognized in that. Why? Because people understood that we had to check our egos at the door. And we had to figure out what are going to be our respective lanes with that. You know, we had some conversations um, um, with Tamika Mallory recently, a very dear friend of mine who was a part of the Women's March. And we asked her, how many groups were a part of the Women's March? that you saw that was happening. And she said there was more than 400 participating organizations. Right? The level of coordination and detail and selflessness that has to happen to be successful in order to do that. So then we asked, well, well how were you able to be successful? And, and the conversation was, well, we built a clear theme uh, and the continuation. Women's rights are human rights and how we all have to have the conversation that happens. We've heard that phrase before, but there was a unifying theme that had to happen in that way. Uh, but then it was the conversation of engagement where you can't say, I'm going to have a movement. I'm just going to tell you what's best for you. People were asking for input. Walk me through. How do you want to be involved? How do you want to be a part of this? Talk me through your skills and your talents and your attributes that you can bring to the table so that we can then find a way to be more impactful uh, in that respective way. You think about the other recent examples, uh, rejecting of the repeal of the Affordable Care Act. And when I talk about how it has to be the difference between a moment to a movement, 
when you're hearing conversations now coming back again around health care uh, and the repeal of it, that's a reminder of why you have to stay engaged and very clearly of how we're going to talk this through in, in terms of how you make this all happen. The blocking of the travel ban, the March for Science, the rejection of the gutting of the Office of Ethics. Uh, I'm giving these as examples to demonstrate we've only been in going through 2017 for a few months and we've already had five major moments that are a part of a movement of resistance. You see where I'm going? Right? And the reason why you can be excited is because you don't forget on the previous victory that you had. You know, one thing we always try to tell people when you're trying to be engaged as organizers is how do you win hearts, minds, and elections? Right? You know? And we're very real about that. We talk about that regularly. You know, you know, you, you couldn't be successful at the Malala Front without saying we're going to have clear objectives, right? You know, where are we trying to go? You know, it, it's not sufficient just to say we're going to march. Why are we marching? It's not sufficient to say we're going to protest. Why are we having a protest? It's not sufficient to say we're just going to stand outside here. Well, what are we doing it in, in this particular way? So when you think about how this gets engaged and plugged in, the Ethics Council, Ethics uh, uh, Panel is a perfect example itself. Uh, people across the country said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to pick up our phones. We're going to make phone calls. We're going to be mobilized. We're going to have targeted efforts. But that was successful because it was clear talking points and there was a clear phone number and there was a clear way to utilize that energy. I can tell you that when we passed health care in the White House, one of the reasons we were able to pass it is we were very clear with the explanations of things. Don't assume someone knows how to be a part of the resistance. You know, just because someone has the energy and the passion doesn't mean they don't have the instruction. Right? And so how do you walk them through, how do we do this? So how do we walk this through? Number one, ensure aligned impact and aligned goals. Try to have similar opportunities and impact, even if you have different goals. So for example, pro-life and pro-choice organizations partnering for the Women's March that came together in that way. So you can have different groups, and that's OK. We can have different viewpoints, and that's OK. We could disagree on a lot of different things, and that's fine if we're clear on what is the impact we're trying to have. You know, I, I, I try to always convey um, to a lot of our conversations that we have around the country, uh, I'm not looking for a monolithic group. You know, I want to have a divergence of conversations and spirits. That actually makes you better, makes you stronger. Uh, but you're able to be successful if we know where we're trying to go. So when you think about how that, that, that played itself out, we always try to game out the conversations we have with our team. We call it SAR, Situation Action Result. You know, I go back to my, my, my time as a TV producer. You know, whenever you watch a, a TV broadcast, presume if it's a 30-minute uh, newscast, 30-minute news, you're probably getting 22 minutes of content. Right? And so if I'm doing 22 minutes of content and I have a story, a story might be 90 seconds. So I got to be thinking through what is the situation, what is the action, what is the result? Think that exact same way when you're trying to organize. If I'm trying to have a line impact, what is the situation that's in, at hand? What is the action we're trying to get done? What is the result we're trying to have accomplished from here? So if I see that there's injustice happening and we're not having the, the, the opportunities of having greater funding as it relates to our schools, or we're trying to figure out how to make sure we deny the repeal of health care, that's the situation. There's multiple actions that can come about that, but then what's the results we're trying to get from that? And if you're able to lay it out in that way while simultaneously saying what's the aligned impact we're trying to have and what are the aligned goals we're trying to have, it allows you to be more impactful as an organizer. And I'm being very clear in dividing it up by saying the second point. All movements that are effective have clear goals and objectives. Passing raise the age, which I'll talk about right now. A goal and an objective are very different things. Right? Too often we use those words interchangeably. They are not the same. An objective is, what's the benchmark? What's the metric? What am I tangibly trying to change in this way? The goal is what's aspirational. So I want to have more justice as it relates to criminal justice reform, but my objective is to make sure we're changing things as it relates to bail and having policies as it relates to bail. There's a clear distinction there. So for example, raise the age. Many people may not be aware. Uh, New York and North Carolina were the last two states where 16 and 17 year olds were tried as adults. We had been regularly pushing on this, and we finally changed the legislation this year because we put our foot down. And on our speaker, Carl Hasty, was the leader around this and saying, we're not going to pass the budget unless you change the raise the age. You know? Now, the, the, the first piece of the goal for a lot of conversations is, okay, we want to have raise the age. The objective are, well, what's the legislation? 
What's the components of it? What are the parts we're going to fight for? So as you're thinking about how do you organize and how do you lead your resistance and how to sustain the resistance long term, be very clear of the difference between the goals and objectives you're trying to accomplish uh, in that manner and in that way. Number two is you know, map out assets. Or on the other side, you could say asset mapping. Too often, what does not happen is very clear conversation for us to understand what does everyone have to bring to the table. So too often what's happening is that you'll have organizations, if you have 400 organizations that show up, 400 different ways we can all be addressing the same problem, but we have to then determine how do we divide this up in a very clear way. So optimize your shared resources, compare resources we have versus they have. You know, there has to be a selflessness for long-term ability for a resistance to sustain itself. So we're gonna, we may have expertise in eight, 10, 15 different things, but we're gonna focus on these two so that you focus on three and four, and then you focus on five and six, and we're gonna be very clear about that and how we mobilize, because if I bring multiple groups to the table, that's how we can be more effective. Going back to the example I used for Raise the Age, there were a lot of members of the Raise the Age Coalition. However, everyone had to play their part in a very dedicated way. And if you think about it in that way, then you could say, you know what, if we're trying to get one year, five year, 10 years, 20 years down the line, and we're not just thinking about trying to have success this year, it allows us to then shift our priorities. You know what, if I'm trying to think about 10 years, 15 years, 20 years down the line, then I gotta make adjustment in how our budget is for our organization. How do we hire? What's our strategy? Where are we going in our particular places? We may have gone into the South regularly, but for this exercise, we have to go into the Northeast. We might have regularly tried to load up on, on communications and research, but maybe this time it's on field organizing. But if you think about it in that tactical way, you can move the needle. Using the example there, rock the vote. News organizations, artists, actors, actresses, pushing for youth engagement uh, in that way, expanding the voting that happened in 2008 and beyond. You can't have a coalition of multiple parts unless there's individual understanding of what the parts are supposed to do. And too often, we're not doing that to have sustained movements. You know, we'll leave from tonight, this will be the end of the resistance school for tonight, but the reality is there are gonna be multiple forms of resistance that are gonna pop up even when there's not a school. And so the questions then have to be, okay, how do our organization stay engaged and stay a part of this process? Well then, what do we need to do? We first have to identify the gaps in our resources. We gotta use that opportunity for additional partnerships. We have to be more honest with ourselves of what we don't have. And too often we're not doing that. Too often we come to the table and say, you know what, I'm doing everything perfectly, we have great ideas, all these things are gonna work out in that way. The best example I've, I've done for this recently, I've said to folks, you, you can have that level of conversation and believe that you're perfect and you'll be alone. <laughs> you know. I, I really haven't found a, a perfect person. If you can show me that, I, I welcome that. You know, I don't think that's ever gonna work in that way. But there's the understanding, some of y'all chuckling, don't, don't chuckle in your relationships doing that. That would be a little awkward. We don't want that right now, right now. <laughs> no. But it's that understanding of, okay, where are the opportunities that we have? Let's have a true gap analysis. Let's have a true SWOT analysis of our strengths, our weaknesses, opportunities, our threats, to then really break down, okay, where are we trying to go? Again, using Women's March as a recent example, using healthcare repeal as a recent example, they didn't just show up that day and have a march. You know, you're not gonna be successful just showing up that day. There's plenty of legwork that has to happen and it's an understanding, you know what? I don't have this resource, I gotta find who does. Maybe it's communications, maybe it's fundraising, maybe it's, it's voter protection, maybe it's legal, but I have to have someone really break down for me, how do we achieve this? So for those of you, that are trying to figure out how do you get in the game, and this might be the first time that you're doing resistance organizing in that way, recognize there are different lanes on the highway. My, my pastor uh, would tell me this regularly when I was in uh, Illinois. Uh, he would use the example, I don't know if anyone's from Illinois in the room or online, follow us, all right, Illinois, I like you, I went to Northwestern, go Cats, all right? You know? <laughs> and, and so he would say, if I'm in Evanston, I'm trying to get to Chicago, I could go down Lakeshore Drive, you know, I could take 94, I could take the train, however it may be, but I could still end at that same destination. And he was using that from a faith perspective. He was like, there's a lot of ways for us to have that walk. We have different walks, but the same journey, right? In the same way, you have to appreciate that each of you are gonna bring a different skill and attribute and talent and background to the resistance, and that's a good thing. 
You don't want everyone to be able to do the exact same thing. You know, think about this. Six different entities work together to challenge the travel ban and provide counsel for plaintiffs, each providing a unique expertise in that manner. So that means there were multiple organizations, individuals who all had legal training, legal background, had done that walk in that manner, but they understood, you know what? I'm going to have this particular aspect of the resistance. You're going to have this particular aspect of resistance because we're all trying to get to the same end goal. And we were able to understand it in that particular way and walk it through in that particular way. And so when you're thinking through how do you achieve that, what we always try to respect our, our team and kind of have the conversations around is what is your background, what is your skill, and what is your service? Right? So what is my background? You know, maybe my background is communications. Maybe it's legal. Maybe it's finance. Maybe it's digital. Whatever it may be, you know, that's the background I have, you know, that I, in the respective industry. My skill is different from my background, though, right? So I, I might have a communications background, but I'm better with broadcast and TV and radio than I am with print. Or I might be better with magazine because I can do long form than I can, you know, in the in di di digital form. So my service will be I'm going to volunteer to be a press secretary for the nonprofit. My service is going to be, I'm going to help with media training for those that are going to be doing interviews for the marches. That's going to be the way I give back and in that particular way. And so people then understood, you know what? I might be getting involved for the first time and may not understand all the nuances. I'm trying to figure out whether it be political organizing, whether it be issue organizing, social organizing, what have you. But if I want to figure out how I get in, first I got to have the values to connect to what I'm trying to do, to be a part of the institution. And as I'm going towards that, that direction to the institution, then I can apply my service and skill. What do I mean by that? I don't know political affiliations, but I'll use myself. I'm a Democrat. There's a lot of people that have democratic values and democratic principles that may not be a part of the Democratic Party. So I can't assume that you're a part of one or another. But if you want to be engaged, whether you're D or R, then you have to say, you know what? What's my background? My background is in communication and my background is in organizing. What's my skill? I'm really good at getting people to say hello. Hello. Right? right? And then my service will be, I'm going to train the next group of organizers. So and when you're thinking about how to be effective as an organizer, number one, it usually takes someone seven times before they remember your name. They're not making it up. That's actually been studied. That's the reason why you usually get seven pieces of mail. <laughs> think about that. When you think about upcoming elections that happen, there is a reason why these things do happen. You know, there's a reason why the name usually is really large and the messaging is really small. Because when you think about some of the recent studies and another past I had from years ago used to tell us this, people will forget about 90% of what you say to them. But if you keep walking through what's happening, right, and you have that repeti uh, repeated message that's happening in that way, okay, now I'm engaged. Now I can pick up on this, right? You know, I think about the efforts when we talk about train the trainer, you know, my, my skill of how do I help someone with, with fundraising, for example, which fundraising is applicable. If you want to build movements, you need resources. You know, you can't just build a movement without resources. Give them the exercise of the circles of influence, where you have someone do the first exercise of, I'm going to draw a circle. The first circle is going to be my inner circle. Every one of my family and friends that are closest to me, I'm going to put in this right here. That means you're going to ask some cousins and siblings that you may not have talked to, but you're going to ask them for money anyway. It's going to be OK. You know? <laughs> then the next ring is, what's my next closest circle? What's my next closest circle? And literally start to think through that orbit in that way. When I did that exercise the first time and just trying to think through how I can expand out my different fundraising apparatus to be able to build in that way, I was able to think of 18 different circles, which I promise you, when you do this exercise, you'll also start to understand, you know what? I didn't realize my skill could be this. So if my skill is this, then my service can be that. And if you want to figure out ways to sustain a movement, then you have to figure out how does your service get sustained. Because your skills will have variance over time. But if you think about, I want to find more ways to provide, you ask yourself, if you were a lawyer and went to the airport to help when people were being detained, are you still providing that service? If you showed up and helped people organize and get involved with the trainings, are you still getting involved with that training in that respective way? So as you're thinking about where do we go from there, it's about measuring progress. Sometimes we get uncomfortable with this conversation. 
But if you really want to have the ability to sustain a movement, you got to be able to measure the progress. You, know, you can't just say, well, something happened. Well, that, that's not sufficient. What happened? You know, I, I ask our team regularly, what changed for the better because of us? If someone tells you, well, it feels good, that's insufficient. Utterly insufficient. Whenever someone tells me that they, they came back to me and they had a metric based success and it ends with a zero or five, I tell them that they're lying. <laughs> I really do. Because the likelihood that you did an activity and it ended in a zero or a five is very low. <laughs> very low. So more than likely, you didn't really do what you're saying you did. Now, don't use that with your professors. I'm just trying to help you out right now, right now. Yep. <laughs> But when you think about, you know, I know uh, Marshall Gans was talking about this recently. Uh, the island teams are disconnected. Dot leadership is exhausting. Snowflakes build capacity and power. Right? You want to talk about how you build capacity and power, you got to do it through metrics. You know, how do I see growth? How do I see development? So continue communication. It's easy to be committed to building together without checking in on progress. You can't have a sustained movement if you're not real about yourself on if we're moving. Too often, we said, we feel really good because we had a press conference that went well today. OK, well, you had a press conference. But did you get any press out of it? Uh, did anyone change life behavior because of it? Did anyone do anything? Well, nothing. OK, well, it wasn't successful then. You, know, you just felt good because someone showed up with a camera. You know? Or they showed up with a camera, and you went on. You had great talking points. You said everything you want to say. But then you, you messed up one line. And then the entire story was about that one line. I know that doesn't happen to anyone in this room, right? You know, never, right? Always ask yourself, did you give someone an action when you're putting it out there? You know, I want you to call this number. I want you to knock on these doors. I want you to do this activity. I want you to do this in this way. Because then you have the ability to measure your progress. You know, I use a separate example, using another nonprofit. You know, Reverend Sharpton, they now, for National Action Network, uh, at the end of their conferences now have what's called measuring the movement. Uh, and they've been doing that on the Saturday afternoons itself. And one thing that's been good about it is it, now you can have a real conversation. What did we actually do to change something? You know? So every single night, you know, sometimes people don't think about this in politics, I have metrics-based reports that my team send me. How many people did we knock on their doors today? How many residents who didn't have heat earlier this morning now have heat tonight? How many kids did we get books to today? If you can't tell me that, we were not successful. And quite frankly, you would not operate in that manner in any way in anything else you do. So why would you operate that way in a movement? If you were in class and someone just said, well, you're doing well, that's not sufficient. <laughs> How am I doing well? What am I doing? How do I get better? You know, you leave and you go into the business aspect. How do you grow in that manner? So establish and commit to metrics and measurements for success. And that's why I keep going back to it, what I said at the top. There's a difference between goals and objectives in the movement. Right? If I want to figure out the long term goal, let me give you another example. Let's use a policy example. There's an effort called Campaign for Fiscal Equity in New York where parents and educators all came together and said, we can demonstrate that the public schools are being underfunded in New York sued, won the lawsuit. We are still battling on this lawsuit. $4.1 billion owed to these kids in the, these respective schools. But the reason why we were able to be able to move forward in this way is that multiple organizations came together and they were not just thinking, I want to be successful this year. It's how do we continue to keep moving? Because even when we get to the point of having full funding, a kid's still going to need help. I, I said to uh, people recently when we were having a, a criminal justice conversation, I was like, raise the age has happened. Yes, it's a first step. There's a lot more that needs to happen. I know we're upset we didn't get more, but you got to take a step back. When Rockefeller drug laws were changed in New York, it took multiple steps for that to happen. Right? And if you need more motivation, I tell, uh, especially when I'm in conversations with, with young men of color and, and those that are engaged, I'm on the advisory board for My Brother's Keeper Alliance. I said, one thing that keeps me going is that one out of every th three black men are going to serve time in prison. That's the current stat. One out of six Latino men versus one out of 17 white men. I have to think about this regularly because I'm that kid from the Bronx. My community is the most diverse county in America, according to the census. 
How do I prove that? Through the numbers. We have an 89.7% likelihood that any two people you meet in the Bronx will be a different ethnicity. We have the largest West African population in the world outside of West Africa, is in my district. And because of that, we were very clear in how we changed things because we knew the numbers. We weren't having a feel good conversation. We were very tactical. So what do we do? We said we have to have language access to change things so that we now have papers and materials in French. But I was able to have that conversation because we knew the numbers. And you're able to be involved and mobilized in that way. Cancer Moonshot 2016, clear goal, making a decade of progress. 70 public-private uh, public partnerships and commitments, creation of the Cancer Moonshot. You understand that's not just gonna happen in one day. It's gonna take some time to be able to get there uh, in that way and in that manner. So you think about the resistance long-term. The long-term resistance doesn't just happen theoretically. It happens regularly and throughout. Montgomery, Little Rock, Freedom, King awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, Malcolm assassinated, Voting Rights Act, Brown versus Board, bus boycott, all the different opportunities. All I'm trying to convey, a movement doesn't happen in one day. And you have to understand that there's deeper pieces that happen along the way. You know, When King was assassinated, Lyndon Johnson had gathered many leaders around. And one of the things that I, I, I read and, and always reflect on, it says, why would you be surprised that they're having riots and protests when you've been having your foot and your neck on their neck and their back for 300 years? So then people say, well, we got to keep mobilizing and keep being engaged in that manner and continue to make sure we have that progress. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying to convey the point to you, and hopefully this is what's resonating. You have to have multiple steps along the way to sustain it long term that you have to be thinking it's not just about one day and flip it the other way for those that might be disappointed by the election results last year or excited about the election results that happened last year. That was just one day. That was not a lifetime. It was an election. It's not eternity. Right? So how do you shift and have a different perspective on how you think about things for the long term and being engaged in that respective way? So how will you sustain? I, I uh, uh, the book that has held me, uh, God's Politics by Jim Wallace, last line of the book, we are the ones we've been waiting for, uh, talked about throughout values the entire time. <laughs> we, we could have different perspectives, but we have values that can align us that can unite us and bring us all together in this way. If I want to figure out how I get to the long term, it's figuring out how we have those values and those perspectives in that way and in that respective manner. So I'm going I'm to tie this together uh, by, by saying the, the following things and again saying thank you for our, our, our Q&A. First, determine your end goals and then work backwards. Be very clear of where we're trying to go. How, how are we trying to make the adjustments along the way? If, if I'm thinking through a resistance and a long-term movement, then I gotta ask myself, well, where are we trying to go? Because then if I do it that way, it allows me to build a more efficient manner. Let me break this down for you electorally. You know? If I have an election day on a Tuesday, I gotta think about the weekend before, that's get out the vote weekend. Weekend before that is me preparing, and that's usually the trial runs itself. But I have to know, how many voters do I need? How many you know, doors are we going to be knocking on? Me knowing those numbers then determine how many people that are mobilizing in this way. In order for me to know that number at the end, then I work backwards and I know I need to get X number every single day to get me there. You think about the movements itself. If you're trying to have 100,000, 500,000, a million that are showing up for activities or the look at the Women's March, 6 million women and, and allies across the world engaged, that doesn't just happen without preparation. Right? And it was being very clear, what are our end goals? And their goal and their thought was not, I'm just going to have one activation. I'm going to be mobilizing a continual way and mobilizing that way. Second, you heard me say this earlier, proper preparation prevents poor performance, as it always will and always does. Third, find your why. Fourth, SAR, situation, action, result. What is the situation? What's the action? What's the result we're trying to achieve from this? How do we have the, the clear de determination of our shared values, our shared responsibilities, how they lead to shared benefits? You know, because if I understand that intersectionality, 
But then let me tie this together and make a, a personal anecdote uh, as a way to close this out. For many people in this room, or many people that may be following us online, this might be your first time a part of a resistance. This may be your first time a part of a movement, if you will. Hopefully it won't be your last. When you think about the, the find your why, I'm gonna give you two very brief anecdotes that hopefully bring it home. I told you that my daddy's favorite color was red, right? Uh, my, my dad for 28 years, mopped hospital room floor, St. Barnabas Hospital, SCIU 1199 back home in the Bronx. My, my mama for 40 years worked in a manufacturing plant in New Jersey. That's, that's, that, that's what built it up. But it built it up because I remember that on Saturday afternoons, we would have to sell dinners to pay rent, to have enough money to pay rent. And when I finally got to the White House and I was sit sitting there and then my, I had a portfolio, it was black and gold because I'm an alpha. I'm part of Alpha Fraternity Incorporated because it had to be black and gold, right? A5, right? Um, my mom stood there quietly and I said, tell me what's going through your mind. And she said, baby, we went from no house to the White House. Because <laughs> my, my mama was homeless in Jamaica. She slept on church pews. And so the, the, the trajectory was now, we went from no house in Jamaica to the Black House in Northwestern to the White House in DC, now to the State House in Albany. Right? I didn't know what the long term was going to be. But because I thought about how just to be prepared, it allowed me to be ready for what came. To the men in the room, I say regularly, I say this often, I'm a man, I'm also a feminist. Right? Yeah. If someone goes after any community, you need to stand up and be clear about that. So if someone goes after women's rights, you go after me. You go after the Muslim rights, you go after me. You go after immigration rights, you go after me. You go after anyone else, you go after me. You gotta think about it in that way. You gotta be thinking about it to that next level. And how do I take it to the next level? Because I think about it in visuals. When I think about the find your why. There's a photo that was hanging up in the White House when we were there every single day that the president said was gonna hang up there throughout the entire two terms. There's a photo of a little young boy named Jacob Philadelphia. Now, Jacob's father, Carlton, was a national security staffer that was retiring. He was about to leave office, about to be engaged in that way. Came in, and during his final uh, exit interview, he said, Mr. President, um, both of my kids have a question, but I don't know what the question is going to be. Which, for any of you who are parents, you'd be terrified at that moment right there, right? <laughs> right? So his first kid, Isaac, says, Mr. President, why would you eliminate the F-22 fighter jet program? kind of surprise you, but then you remember, okay, his daddy was a national security staff. Okay, I can, I can kind of gauge this, right? All right? All right? But then five-year-old Jacob, five-year-old Jacob asked this question, and this is why I say find your why. This is how you sustain yourself for the long term. Jacob said, Mr. President, I just got a new suit. And um, Mr. President, I, um, I just got a haircut. And then he started to slowly stretch out his hand. He said, but Mr. President, I was, um, I was wondering if I could touch your hair to know if it feels like mine. So he got quiet, he kind of pulled his hand back and he and what, and said, what, say that again. He said, I was wondering if I could touch your hair to know if it feels like mine. And he pulled his hand back again and the president said, touch it, dude, just touch it. All right? And then he, he touched it and he said, what do you think? He said, yeah, it feels like mine. How do you sustain the resistance long term? Find your Jacob, find your why. Find your Jacob, find your why. Find your Jacob, find your why. me in the back with some amens and come ons and uh-huhs. It's us do my part. <laughs> All right, well, my name is Vegan Stone. I'm so grateful to be with you today, and I'm so honored to be a very small part of this last class of the semester as everyone gets ready for the next semester. But I really want to start with honoring. They didn't ask me to do this, so surprise. I want to honor everyone that has worked on this project because I've seen you working tirelessly for weeks, and so I just want to say thank you. So good. 
It takes a lot. It takes a lot. They've, they've worked really hard to create a community and a curriculum, and so thank you. Thank you for all that you've done. So I'm so excited to speak with you. Save the best for last, or maybe oh. first among equals. Don't oh. tell anyone else that spoke. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really excited to talk to you about something that's really relevant to start here with so many students, which is about young leadership. So I had this great privilege of working for well, I'll use the last three years, and I like to say my boss is 19 years old um, fully, <laughs> and I worked for a teenage girl from the Global South, and was so proud to be able to say that. But there's a real need right now, it doesn't matter what party you're from or what political persuasion, to really encourage and empower new leaders and younger leaders. And so I know something you've been talking about a lot yep. is millennial engagement and why that has to happen, how it has to look different, and what does that mean in terms of how money is spent, in terms of how political activity takes place regardless of party, what does that mean in terms of the kinds of communities we're going to go to, and what does every millennial mean? Not just some millennials, but millennial communities of color, right. um, socioeconomically disenfranchised communities like we see in the South Bronx. Right. What does that need to look like? What does that change need to be? I, I always reject the notion uh, of wait in line and wait your turn. You know? uh, I've never really seen progress happen when you wait your turn, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, and um, you know, I tell people often, even I, I have some grays in my chin, but I'm only 34, right? <laughs> you know, um, and, and you know, I do. I really do believe we have a responsibility uh, to step up right now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you, you can't just talk about it and be on the sidelines. I don't. I don't. I don't, uh, I don't think that's appropriate. And so, I spend a lot of time with an organization called New Leaders Council. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm one of the co-chairs with Senator Kane. We have. Uh, about 44 chapters across the country now training millennials all across the country uh, in which what regularly is going through our mind is you have to train people, right? It, it's, it's not that there is a lack of interest and opportunity. They just may have lack of, the, uh, of, of access to the program, to the initiative uh, itself. Uh, and so when I think about like for, for those of us to have the chance to change the game, I'm a person of faith, you've probably picked up on that by now, right? Uh, uh, I, I regularly say, especially around, you know, not just Christmas time, which I'm, I am a Christmas baby, but, and I get both <laughs> gifts, don't worry, right, you know? Um, uh, I said Jesus was only 33, he did a lot. You know, so, so don't, don't talk to me that we can't do a lot because mm -hmm. of age, right? Uh, but the reality is we have a responsibility also to listen and truly listen to those that came before us on what worked and what wasn't working and how we make it better. Like you can't just say, I'm just gonna show up and be the best person that showed up. That, that's, that's never gonna work, you know? You know? Michael Jordan, arguably the best basketball player ever, did not win championships every single year he played when he started out. He, he had to get trained, he had to get opportunities, he had to put a team around him, you know? Uh, and so you can have, and which we do, have talent, but you have to connect that talent with purpose. Uh, and you have to understand, we all have to understand, uh, we do have a responsibility to step up right now. What, what do you think is the responsibility of, of political structures? Because a lot of people who are watching this live stream or sitting in this room are going to go out, they're going to have to interface with people in their communities. What do they need to ask locally or nationally to change in terms of the way we invest in digital tools, the way that we go to communities, how we even spend money um, when we're talking about issues and campaigns and communities. You know, if you follow the money, it always reveals priorities, right? So we see how oftentimes these communities aren't reached. There's no money spent. There's no real engagement that's authentic or the right spokespeople for those communities that we're holding up. What are some practical ways that maybe people in the room could make these asks as they're going out and getting engaged? In, uh, in the previous election, what the president. So in the first election, just for context, I was in nine different states. I started in Iowa doing organizing, and in the second election, I was the national deputy director for Operation Vote Buffy Wicks. And um, there, by the end of the second election, uh, Barack Obama's Facebook page, his first ring of friends, and then the, the next ring from there. So his friends and the first set of friends. We were connected to 96% of the U.S. Facebook population. Even your phone got excited about that right there, right? You know, <laughs> That's an important call. You know, you know, Sometimes you, know, you, gotta you gotta take that call. You gotta take those calls, right? Gotta take it. Uh, yeah. Now, why, is that, why does that matter? Uh, and why is that relevant? Because then we were able to sync up the, uh, the people that we thought were not registered to vote with your Facebook friends so that you can then send out messages on Facebook to say, hey, if you're not registered, we need you to get registered. Mm -hmm. right? uh, we have not been investing seriously in organizing in the way we need to. You know? Uh, I, I tell people regularly, 
you know, whether it be political party or your own relationship. You can't show up for a first date and then not holler at someone for three months and be surprised they don't take your call. <laughs> I'm, hey, I, hey, this this the kind of resistance we're gonna get around right here. You know, I don't, I don't know what's going on in Cambridge. I'm gonna tell you about the Bronx, <laughs> right? So, right? so I'm just I'm serious. Like, I, I, I one of the reasons I ran for vice chair is I. How are you gonna link what you just said? I want to this, oh, so watch, like, watch, watch, watch me now. Like, you know, hey, yo, don't believe me, just watch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, hey, like the the reality was. I regularly was seeing that we were not engaging, mm -hmm. right? We were showing up to the base, we were showing up to millennials and communities of color and women four weeks before an election mm -hmm. and saying, well, we just hope you're just going to show up. Yeah, I heard of a group that got a million dollar check to do African American voter uh, turnout a week before the election. Mm. You know, and they were like, what are we, how are we supposed to yeah. plan to spend these funds effectively or really make this money count if we're getting this at the very last minute? Why weren't you talking to us six yeah, or seven months ago? Get engaged all the time. Yeah. And, and so the, the, the way we do that practically is a few different pieces. Number one is consistently utilizing the validators that may not seem as traditional validators, mm -hmm. right? So uh, for the Ossoff race down in Georgia, you know, I've done a bunch of call ins on radio uh, because you got to recognize. There could be someone that's a radio host that's talking to millions of people in that manner. Or in New York, when I'm talking about Raise the Age, and I'm on Ebro in the AM on Hot 97, you know, they're going to be talking about relationship advice and music and hip-hop and artists and everything, but they're going to make the connection of, let's talk about criminal justice. All right. So how do I connect with the validators that may not seem tradition in that same manner? Number two, we have to get better of utilizing technology for organizing. You know, you know, you know, Arab Spring and all that has happened didn't just happen by coincidence. <laughs> you know, like we, we sometimes try to ignore that reality. And as much energy that we spend uh, posting and tweeting and all, everything we're doing, and you know, selfish plug, MR Mike Blake, my Twitter handle, just put that out there. You know, but if you're out there, just gonna slide that in. But you know, <laughs> but if, if 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 you're doing this, then do it for purpose. Right, you know, have a call to action. How to get folks involved and engaged in the, in the, in, the, in the same way, you know, uh, in that manner. And then the last thing that goes to my mind in terms of how do we actualize this mm -hmm. is two parts. One, there's a lot of energy that exists right now that's wondering where do I go. Right, I want to do something, but I don't know what the something is. I want to get involved in a cause, whether it be political or nonprofit. So how do we then bring greater awareness? for the entities that are out there and use you know, digital metrics on that and opportunities around that. So if you talk about you know, a swing left or flippable uh, mm -hmm. that are all out here in these different ways, okay, well, I'll make you aware of that. But then two, how do we connect other people to, of that information? So when I talk about New Leaders Council, I want people to understand, hey, there's a group that's doing things, but I want you to go tell other people about it. Right? And, and that's how you can make that connection to get folks mobilized, because then they'll be like, okay, I have energy, I have interest, but I gotta figure out what my cause is. That's so good. Well, I think the, the digital discussion is a great reminder to anyone that's watching the live stream. We don't want to be the only one asking and answering questions in this room. We want you to actually post questions. So you can do that in two ways. You can do a hashtag resistance school, or you can just do it to the Twitter handle. So it's resist underscore school. And so get the questions in now so that they can actually get asked at the end of our session. So think now about what you want to hear answered. So I want to go just to values because you were talking before about values. So I know social justice is, is core to everything that you do. I think a lot of people may be wondering when they get into advocacy, you know, they think about government, they think about campaigns, they think about being part of activist groups or advocacy issues. You know, how do you make a decision if these are the values that are central to you, if people are figuring out where they are in the continuum? Am I meant to be on the outside of a system, holding up the values that I believe in, what I think needs to change, and fighting from the outside? Or do I get inside something that can be bureaucracy, like like, I don't know, maybe a party that's political at times, maybe like that, just potentially, maybe theoretically, um, or working, God forbid, in government or on a campaign that has, you know, I don't know, like a headquarters and like maybe a field office that doesn't always agree. This is, again, I, these are just, just totally just, theoretical. Just theoretical. I mean, I, yeah, totally, just really way out I'm there. I'm just saying. Yeah, just saying. Yeah. So, I mean, how, how do you figure out how to do that? If you're called to be someone's on the outside going, you've got to move this agenda to this side, or if you're supposed to be that, that advocate within a system? Because they're, they're two different stances, and I think sometimes people aren't sure where they belong. Like, how, how did you think about that in your career? How could you encourage people watching or in the room tonight? So, I, uh, we, we, we have a, a top line vision that we try to think through in our district. Uh, we call it 3-2-1, 3 for the three E's of economic development, education, and equity. 
And for a while, we were saying equality for all, but it was like, no, we don't, we're not talking about equality, we want equity, mm -hmm. right? Um, the two is the two paths of minority women-owned businesses and education. But then the one goal was how do we transform the South Bronx into the urban metropolis of the world, right? And to the question, the only way I could do that, we could do that, mm -hmm. is by a lot of different people getting involved, either as policymakers, as the political change, make, uh, change agents, as the nonprofit leaders. So for example, you know, we want to create a tech hub in our district you know, to, to address the challenges that exist in our community. You know, 38.5% of those uh, in our community that are 25 and older don't have a high school diploma. You know? uh, and so how are we trying to do that? The Bronx is the home for hip hop, so we want to try to create a hip hop museum. You know? and, and you know, we need help to actualize that. And the reason that goes to my mind is like, look, there's gonna be a lot of ways to do that, through policy, you know, through who's gonna be the donors, through who's gonna be the message agents that make that happen in these different aspects in that way. I made the decision I wanted to be in politics because I fundamentally felt that there is no more comprehensive way to change lives than through public service. I, I believe that, you know. Uh, I almost died twice, you know. Uh, I was born with a heart murmur, I was in ICU for four weeks, and I fell asleep at the wheel in 2001, and the only reason I didn't go over the cliff with the hands of God and my luggage we had in the car. You know? mm -hmm. and, and six days before that, we wrote out something that said, Dear God, uh, today may be my greatest day, greater than the great day I have a day before, but my goal has not been met unless tomorrow is greatest than them all. That still hangs on my mom's fridge. You know? mm -hmm. uh, so for everybody, it's figuring out you know, what is your background, your skill, your service. That's how we were able to do that. You know? it's, it's that understanding, I got to figure out what really drives me. And, and uh, when I'm, I'm thinking um, now, you know, I'm, ho I'm hoping that we can turn anger and frustration into positive energy, right? Um, and, and what I, I made this decision is I, I refuse to sit on the sidelines and let others be the change agents, you know? In 2011, when I was still at the White House, Pluff said to me, you will never forgive yourself if we lose and you're sitting here. Uh, and he was right. He was right. And, and lastly, you have to decide that sometimes your purpose will change, and that's okay. Sometimes you've got to have different careers. So you have different roles. You've got to have different parts to play in this. Uh, so for now, for me, it's being actively involved uh, in this way. But as it relates to social justice, look, I'm constantly talking about what are we doing for bail reform? Because it's, it's an inhumane that people are struggling because they can't afford bail to, to have justice mm -hmm. for them, you know? And what do you do to break the school to prison pipeline? Don't talk to me on the back end of someone being locked up if you didn't help them on the front end, mm -hmm. you, know? you know? What do you do to have professional development for the teachers and provide these different opportunities? Like, all this part is, a, is, a, is relevant there, but I am not gonna be the one that's gonna be the expert on each of those issues. A lot of people are gonna be engaged in that way. Uh, and if my role is to be the convener and other people to be the catalyst, then that's what we have to do. Yeah, and it's, it's really powerful how the two work together because I can tell me times I've sat with elected officials, whether it was internationally sitting with a prime minister or Say the president. Say how you president. feel about elected officials. I enjoy working with them as an activist and an advocate <laughs> um, because, and they say to us, they need us. They're like, we, we, we need you guys making noise outside the building because it's really hard for me to move the dial inside the building it's true. if there is no noise on the outside. And we're not gonna agree 100% um, about what this policy position will be or what this change will be, but it can move the dial and no so keep, keep making noise. So I have a question about coalition building. Uh, I feel like coalitions are like Dickens is like best of times, worst of times, like all wrapped up into one. Like if you want to change things, you need a coalition. If you failed, you probably didn't handle the coalition very well. Um, <laughs> it happens. You go to like coalition planning meetings and literally spend weeks and months like developing a platform before you even like talk to anybody outside the building and yeah. you're going back and forth with like text changes. And over lots of PowerPoints. Lot, yeah, PowerPoints and like don't use this term, use that one. We can't sign on unless you do this. Uh, so what are some like high-low examples for you of like coalition, like great mountaintop moments where you're like, this really won the day, and then moments where you just failed. You know, you did something wrong, you learned from it, you know, some way, I'm sure you've never done anything no, no, wrong because no, no, you, no, you've accomplished no, a lot, no, but no. just in case you did, is there a wow. moment where you really just had a learning opportunity? Is there something that was like a huge win and you were like, it, it truly was the force of this coalition, this was a winning, shining moment? We got a comedian up here. I see how I'm going out here. I see, I see how this is going to be today. See how it's going to be. Okay. How do you sustain the resistance under attack over here right now? Right now. You know? Yeah, gosh. 
Um, I just want you to be sharp. No, it's be okay. Sharp. It's okay. It's fine. It's fine. I'm Jamaican. <laughs> we are here. Um, uh, let's see. Coalition building uh, painful exercise. <laughs> um, I think it's like a marriage. Everyone's like, I'm getting married. It's awesome. It's going to be great. And then they get married and they're like, this is really hard. Like staying together and working this out and they have to figure it out, right? I'm, I'm, like, I'm, 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 I'm not touching any of that right there. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna, All the married I mean, people say Yeah, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm true. good. <laughs> this is not a, a resistance school on relationships, right? <laughs> you know, in that way. Um, but I think the tough point, um, Was I, I, I'm, there's two topics that are coming to mind immediately. Minority women-owned businesses um, and that conversation around equity through economics mm -hmm. in that manner. Um, and last year on Raise the Age, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I, I was not successful at first when trying to move forward on minority women-owned businesses getting more access to capital and contract than when I was in DC and then in New York because I wasn't understanding that you gotta play the game with language to make some people comfortable, mm -hmm. right? And so folks were here, minority-owned business, whoa, 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 we're not trying to do anything. They were here, women-owned business, oh, yeah, I, I'm not, not trying to touch that, right, at all. Uh, and it would become very frustrating, I'm like, look, this is the right thing to do, why are we not doing this? But the second I realized that within the language, that small business had the same definition practically, and my whole conversation was like, we need to talk about small business. Absolutely. <laughs> right? And then what happened? We got a law passed last year at the end uh, so that any small minority women owned business below 300 employees in New York State has to be paid in 15 days instead of 30 days. But it was painstaking frustration mm -hmm. Because quite frankly, racism, sexism, and misogynistic behavior still exist in this country. We can't ignore that, right? And it, it was the shift of a word. Uh, and I had to let go of that frustration. I had to let go of my pride. You know, I had to think about the end goal, right? <laughs> the reality is this. Um, Raise the age last year. Uh, Khalif Brother was my constituent, you know, the young man you hear about. You know? yeah. His mom was my constituent. His mom, she literally died of a broken heart. Like she kept having heart attacks. You know, that's why she passed away. You, know, you think about a kid was alleged, who allegedly stole a book bag, was in solitary confinement for two years, incarcerated for three years, mental health issues. But again, we don't talk about mental health enough in our communities. We need to be real about that, right? Um, last year, I thought we were making progress, making progress. And folks were like, you know what? We're not doing this because we're not helping these rapists and murderers and gangbangers run the streets. I was like, oh, well, oh, that's what we're doing now. Oh, OK, all right? So this year, we had to turn it around and had the, the broader conversation. I was like, well, if it was your kid who was 16, 17 year old, don't you believe they deserve a second chance? You know, you're, you're telling me, you know, last year we were having a conversation around opioids, right? And we have a crisis, we acknowledge that. However, there was, a, there was a crack epidemic that was happening at the same time. There's been drug epidemics happening in a lot of communities for decades. We weren't mm -hmm. talking about it in the mm -hmm. same way. So it was that frustration that I had. Um, but this year we were able to get it done because we were just like, look, we're not, we're not moving forward without this. But we had to understand we couldn't allow perfection to be yeah. the end destiny. Yeah, right? I feel like vocabulary and values can get confused sometimes oh. when you work in a coalition. Regularly. And you have to be able to be flexible. Communication doesn't succeed unless it's received and then has action, like you were saying earlier, right? Yeah. So yeah. you Absolutely. can be really right and be all alone. Oh, like you straight said up. So look, you can, yeah. you can regularly say something and say it in a very linear sense, and someone receives the complete opposite. Right? Because of their experience and their background and their thoughts. And so what I had to start picking up was, well, tell me what's important to you. Walk, walk me through what's important to you mm -hmm. right now. So when I think about like success, um, you know, My Brother's Keeper, so I'm on the advisory board for My Brother's Keeper Alliance. Uh, we're the first state in the country uh, for $20, $20 million investment last year and this year to help boys and young men of color. Which, there were some real talk conversations from folks who were like, well, why are we going to help these kids of color? Oh, well, I can let me go through the list, right? I, I, I was going through the metrics, trying to walk them through that. But then I made it a connecting point. I said, you're telling me this kid doesn't deserve a chance? That's all I'm asking for is a chance. Mm -hmm. you know? 
uh, and we were able to move the needle in that way. So the coalition came together because a lot of groups came together understanding the bigger cause of we all have an economic impact in this. You know, John Hope Bryant, who runs Operation Hope down in Atlanta, he said, and he said this to me a while ago around the difference between financial literacy and financial capability and how more people came to the table. He said, I stopped trying to have only civil rights conversations with folks who were trying to talk to me about civil rights. He's like, once I started to engage on the economic impact of this, then all of a sudden they started to pay attention. Right? And so when I moved the needle as it relates to my brother's keeper, I was like, oh, you don't want to talk to me about these kids? Well, these kids are going to be your workforce. <laughs> you want to talk to me about technology? Well, let's talk about who are the consumers mm -hmm. of the technology. So, so, so we can either fix this now or later. Now, all of a sudden, oh, now we're here. So that was the success, and we'd be able to move forward in that. Um, and, and recognizing this, you know, um, and I go back, you know, when you think about, again, in the 60s, you know, Martin wasn't the only one marching. Mm -hmm. You know, we got to understand that. Like, a lot of things were happening, you know. You look at Atlanta, you know, you know Mayor uh, Andrew Young and Ambassador Andrew Young, I asked him a few years ago, tell me the difference between Atlanta and Detroit. And he said, we made a conscious decision in Atlanta that it was going to be about economic justice all the time. You know, and whether it was Maynard Jackson, whether it was Andrew Young, was it Kasim Reed, they had that thought process, but it was all around coalition building for the end goal. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what was able to get me there. That's so good. Before I ask you the last question, before we open it up, I want to encourage everyone, again, on the stream to send in your questions. You can tweet at the hashtag resist underscore school or, uh, oh, pardon me, that's the handle, Twitter handle, or the hashtag resistance school. But the last question is actually just about uh, the inside game of being an advocate and activist and your origin story, you, you shared really, I think, powerfully about your family and about your father's example and your mother's. I think a lot of people who have watched this or been part of this may not feel qualified. I think people have gotten a lot of learning and you've done the worksheets and you've heard incredible speakers, but there's still that moment where you have to decide, I'm going to start acting. And I think it's an inside game. We can tell ourselves why we're not qualified. You know, I, I think of working with Malala and it would have been really easy for her to say, I'm, I'm not qualified. Like, I don't have the tools or the resources or the influence to be from a humble family in Pakistan, stamped to the Taliban. I'm a teenage girl who just wants to go to school. There's no way this is, this is going to be possible. But I find time and time again that history uses unqualified, unlikely people. Um, what, what is it about your story that you felt like gave you the strength to overcome and that you can actually encourage people who think they have imperfect preparation, imperfect resources, um, you know, imperfect abilities to actually just decide to, to get involved and to start applying everything that they've learned in, in this course, in this semester, to really just start acting? What, what was it in your own story and like what would you impart? When, when you've been to the, to the bottom, you appreciate everything that you get. You know, like, my, uh, my mom is in Jamaica right now. Her, her, her mom, the woman that raised her, passed away recently, you know. And my mom would tell us the stories of how when she grew up in Alexandria, Jamaica, and how uh, she would you know, go to the market and sell in the market, and how multiple of uh, her siblings were there in a one bedroom, uh, and, and how she had to sleep on the floor and, had, and just and play, place the mat down, and how she would have such appreciation when we would go uh, and grow up in the Bronx. And on Wednesdays, that was the day to go to the supermarket, and Saturdays was the day that we would so, sell dinners and we'd be at church. and like. When, 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 you've, when you've been there, right, you appreciate everything, you know, um, even more. You know, I, I, I don't hesitate talking about, you know, what has happened in my life. I'm, I tell people, I almost died. It, it's, it's hard to uh, take anything for granted when you know that was, was there. My mom beat breast cancer. You know, we, we've seen this in my family. My oldest brother's been in the Army 30 years now, uh, Sergeant First Class. Um, I also had two brothers that were incarcerated, but then they turned their lives around. You know? So the, the reality for me, I don't judge people. And it's real hard to not do, but you got to really take a step back because you don't know someone's story. You don't know what they've been through. You don't know what they've gone through. You know, they can tell you bits and pieces, but they don't, you don't know everything about that person, you know, and, and what makes them tick and what they had to do to get to that moment. Uh, and, you know, don't, don't judge someone's purpose. You may not agree with them on policy and, and philosophy and, and, and the mindsets itself, but, you know, 
when I'm having conversations on the block, I tell these young cats that are there, um, I'm a New Yorker, that was my New York talk that just came out right there, right? <laughs> you know? uh, obviously, I'm a Yankees fan, I'm from the Bronx, don't hold that against me, I know where we're at right now, right? You know? It's like, I can have conversations with them like, because it's, I've lived this experience. July 30th last year, we had a family day in my district at the Morris Houses. Uh, at noon, I had arrived that day. Wait, uh, you got an important phone call now. Okay. <laughs> First rule of events, turn off it's your my, phone. You can do better than this. Man. It's my mother it's calling from mother. Jamaica. Oh, oh. Yeah. No way, you got to take that call. Mama. <laughs> wait, wait, hold on, hold on, because they don't, they don't believe. Mama. <laughs> I'm at Harvard. <laughs> yeah, we're at Harvard right now. You're, you're, you're on speakerphone. Don't embarrass me. <laughs> I love you too. I'll call you later. Yes, mama. Okay. Love you. Bye. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how you top that. Yeah, I'm just saying, saying. <laughs> Got to make sure mama's good. You know. Right? You know? <laughs> Um, I showed up at a family day in Morris Houses at noon. I just, I, I happened to arrive at noon. I was supposed to arrive at noon. Uh, the event wasn't ready yet. Show up, this brother was there and he was telling me, he's like, we had a lot of incidents of, of officers roughing up people on, on the corner. And he actually had video of it from two weeks prior. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, all right. So I kind of put that in my mental Rolodex. I went to a few other events because they weren't ready. I came back around 3, 15, something like that. And I see there's a big commotion happening. I see there's a woman in handcuffs being pulled away. I'm trying to figure out what's going on. Arguments happening here. I walk over, talk to another, one of the officers. Hear another commotion happen behind me. I go back to see what's happening. And then I get tossed against the gate. Mm. Right? Now, I had on a White House polo shirt, slacks, and shoes. I was not looking like a criminal in any way, right? Another officer came over and said, get off of him, get off of him, he's the assemblyman, mm. right? So as soon as they let go of me, and I said some things that I can't say on, you know, because we live streaming right now, right? <laughs> you know? I said, well, first of all, why was your first instinct to toss me against the gate? Mm. Well, we, we thought you were a threat. Interesting, okay. And then the next thing I said is, my title should not lead to a level of justice that someone else can't get. Mm. And the reality is, you only let go of me because you recognized who I was. If, if, you, if the other person would have recognized me, what could have happened right now, right? So when we have the social justice conversations, mm. the criminal justice conversations, even now, when I'm walking throughout my district, my district is 30 blocks north to south, 139,000 people, 21% live in public housing. Like, we see it every mm. single day. They still say, you were the elected that st stood up for us on, on what happened last year. You were the one that the cops messed with, right? But then equally, you were the one that had the cops in the community conversation about how we got to come together. Because I said to them, like, I can't, I can't hold my anger anymore, mm. right? If, what's the point of me being in a place of position? We're not going to do something with this. So, um, you know, my, 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 I would say that my walk, you know, as evidence from my mom, right, you know, is... Um, you know, family always first, always, you know, uh, especially on days like today. I, t I told the organizers uh, I was seriously considering not coming today because I usually don't do things on today. This is my daddy's birthday, right? Uh, but we can't sit on the sidelines right now. Uh, and so hopefully my journey can encourage someone to do more as well. That's so good. Well, I know that Ariana's going to come share some questions, I think, now from Twitter that have been shared from the live stream, so looking forward to hear what those are. Great. So first of all, thank you both so much uh, for taking the time and being with us. <laughs> all right. So we're going to take a few questions from our online audience. As I said, we're so thrilled to have both of you here today. So of course, both feel free to answer the questions. So to get us started, we have Lorna from Kearney, Nebraska, asking on Twitter to Assemblyman Blake, you said, find your why. How about find our why? How can we move past the personal 
to the collective why? Uh, I don't think you can get to the collective until you have your personal. Mm -hmm. Right, like people show up because something fueled them to get there. You know, now the 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 hour is the collective movement, right? But people show up for a whole host of reasons because of what's happened in their life. You know, so you know, yes, we have our why. Yes, I, I recognize that, uh, but. You have more ability to have impact on someone's life when they feel that you've gone through something. You know, and, and when I have conversations back home, they're not theoretical. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I know what it's like to wonder if you're gonna have food to eat that night. We're, not, like, we're having real talk conversations. I know what it's like to engage with someone harassing you for no other reason because you were a black kid walking down the block. You know? So before you can get to the hour why, that's be your. And the reason why I say that is we think about the resistance and that's happening right now. The reality is, would we be having conversations around the resistance if Hillary Clinton would have won? Right? Maybe something good that could come out of this is that a generation has awoken mm -hmm. and said, you know what, we have to be in the game right now. Right? Like we we can't sit on the sidelines, like may maybe that's the purpose, right? And for everyone else, everyone, your individual why varies, but the collective is we gotta do something more. Mm -hmm. We can't allow this to be who we are as a people. And so uh, I recognize, yes, we need to have our why, which you know, the hour can be, let's make our generation greater. Uh, but before you can make a generation great, you gotta make sure that you're, you're, you're whole internally first. Yeah. I mean, I, I think about two answers. One is organizational and, and one is personal. If you want to go out and be an organizer and be doing this work in your communities, which I hope everybody will in this room and who has watched the live stream, you have to. You have to start to take action. But I think it, across the movement, you know, I, I, we had Bob Bland here from mm -hmm. one of the four co-chairs well, of the cool. Women's March. And she talked really honestly at a panel about having to give up some space and say, like, actually, I've never confronted my privilege really accurately before. And I admit that. And I'm going to have to change how I'm approaching this march and I'm gonna stand alongside and learn and listen and take a different stance. And she talked about that really, really in a heartfelt personal way and made choices then as a leader that aligned with that decision. So I think that's important. And then the personal, if you're gonna go out and organize, having a team be in unity is one of the most important things you can do. And it's gonna constantly require you to put you last <laughs> and to put the needs of your team, the needs of the community, the needs of the people you serve or that you're leading ahead of your own. And I think that's really a, a personal challenge of leadership is that you know you can't always be right. Um, you can't you can't force people for too long to follow a vision. They've got to own it. It has to be an, an hour vision, not my vision that I'm giving to you, but ours for them to keep doing the impossible and working long hours and getting up early and staying late and losing sometimes and sometimes winning. So I think it's both. For sure. Thank you. Our next question is from Jeb on Facebook, and Jeb asks. How do you frame your dialogue with opponents to influence them and then include them in your mission? Jeb like Jeb Bush? <laughs> <laughs> Did it have an exclamation point? Just trying to figure out how I should answer the question, answer the question right now, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I'm saying, but Jeb and Derek Jeter are about to buy the Marlins. I mean, that's just cool, right, you know? Um, so I think, uh, I think there's a few quick things. I think first, one thing that Chairman Perez from the DNC has been real clear with us about, and we talk about this a lot now, is you can't keep telling people vote against the other guy. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, that's not motivating. <laughs> like, people want to be inspired. Right? And again, regardless of political affiliation, the reality is people voted for change in 2016 the exact same way they voted for change in 2008. It may not have been your type of change, but they voted for change. Right? Uh, and so when you think through the numbers, 1,042, that's the number of Democratic seats that were lost from the beginning of 2009 to the end of last year, 219, the number of counties that voted for Obama twice that they went to vote for Trump. So clearly you have people who understand the connections that you just have to re-engage with them as to why you want them to be a part of the process, right? So I try to meet someone where they're at, you know? Okay, we may not agree on all the different aspects of criminal justice reform, but what parts can we agree on, all right? So when we did Raise the Age, we, we wanted it to be automatic for all 16, 17-year-olds to go to family court. 
some of the Republicans we were working with said, you know what, they wanted some of the cases to stay in criminal court. We could have made a decision that we're just gonna keep fighting. But the reality now is 77% of the kids that are 16, 17 now have a chance to go to family court. And, I, and we couldn't take the chance of hurting the 77 because we didn't get the whole, mm -hmm. right? So it, it's that understanding of, okay, let me meet you where you're at. Let me un and let me try to really understand where you come from. You know? So when people are talking about, well, why does radio have so much influence in politics? It's because in 31 states in the country right now, truck driving is the number one job. So that means people are in the vehicle for a long period of time. So I have to give you a reason to engage with me because you're hearing rhetoric and messaging on one side for you to believe, well, why should I engage with you? you know? uh, and so uh, to that point, uh, for anyone that has interest later on, uh, uh, we will be having uh, a, an effort this summer called Resistance Summer you know, to give people an opportunity to get engaged and mobilize and find that synergy uh, in, in that way. People want to be connected. You know? Uh, so if you want to find out more, send me a, hit me up on Twitter, send me a note, we'll connect at the end. Uh, but you got to find the ways there and, and be clear of how we have mutual benefit. Remember where mm -hmm. I started at the top, shared responsibility, shared value, shared benefit. Yeah, I mean, I think about it in a global perspective because most of my career has been being in countries that have different value systems, different histories. Sometimes where I come from was, was part of what would happen in that country that was wrong and needs to be addressed. Um, so coming with humility and, you know, the requirement to, to get to agreement cannot be the person agrees with everything that I think, feel, and believe. It just can't be. And I think particularly for my work and looking at the rights of girls and women globally, if I sit down with a father or even a mother, honestly, sometimes, who really believes this is the way it should be, and I say, you have to agree with everything that I think about the rights of girls and women before we can talk about your daughter going to school. Like, no girl's going to school. You know, I, I'm going to go and I'm going to make the best argument I can that will appeal to them. And I'm going to be willing also to throw out what people tell me the reason is that that child isn't or isn't out of school. People could say it's faith. It's actually usually economic in the countries that I work in. It, it's, faith could be an excuse when your family just doesn't have money to send your daughter. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make an argument that works for that, uh, that family in that circumstance because the win is the girl getting into school, like you were saying. Right. Um, and if you wait until perfection, you're not going to win much of anything, frankly. So you have to find the place of alignment. But that's also the heart of diplomacy. I mean, diplomacy is we're going we're gonna to agree on everything, and then we'll, you know, we're gonna find where we can align and somebody's gonna to have to give something up, but they, they can't agree with everything that you think, feel, or believe to start the conversation, it won't work. And the other thing I would just say is personal relationship. I think time spent with communities coming back again and again and being willing to be told no, this is impossible, this is not gonna work, whether you're meeting with a member of Congress or you're meeting with a foreign leader or you're meeting with somebody who's a community leader in you know, Hyderabad, Tunwa, it doesn't matter. Keep, keeping showing up and saying, this relationship is long term for me, whether we agree or not, I'm going to keep coming around. I'm going to keep coming around. And I think that can be the hard work of, of advocacy and activism at times. It takes time. It takes a long time, like you were sharing earlier. Thank you so much. So this is going to be our last question before inviting one of our resistance school team members down to help us wrap up for the evening. So this question comes from Caitlin on Facebook from Washington, DC. And Caitlin asks, defining and measuring success is the key to movement building. How can success be defined across a diverse coalition of actors? And you're throwing me out. <laughs> I mean, I'll answer it too, but I'm just saying, I mean, you know, no pressure. <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I think you have to always be asking yourself that, especially if you're a leader and if you're a com community organizer, you're, you're a leader. You're trying to lead people. You're trying to set a vision and bring them along with you. And you have to keep, keep asking yourself, and I think it has to be linked to impact. Impact for who? And what does it mean? And I think the examples you gave before were just so classic because I would sit with my team all the time at Malala and I'm like, I don't care if we got a great media moment if it didn't move the policy, if it didn't change how much money was being spent on girls' education, if it didn't change the law around child marriage so that a girl had a right not to be married until she was 18 instead of at 14. It doesn't matter if we feel good. Right. And you know, I think oftentimes we have to confront ourselves about like, why does this feel good and feel good to who? And like, does it actually have a measurable connection? And we need to always be asking ourselves, you know, did we get that right? Did, did we get it wrong? And I think when you're in a building season, it could be a startup at an organization, it could be a political campaign, it could be the kind of initiatives that you're going to go out and participate in. I would challenge you to say your your entity, your initiative, your organization, your community group is going to like reboot every like six to eight weeks, and you need to always stop and ask yourself like, what assumptions about success and ways of working are we dragging into this next season that actually were for that season? 
and what assumptions about what is impactful are we dragging into this? Because it's gonna always shift and change. And so I would encourage you to actually have a discipline of keep asking yourself these questions and like, are we really achieving what we say we wanna achieve and for who and for how? But first and foremost, it has to start from listening. You know, I can't come into a community, you know, in a foreign country and tell them what I think they need. I have no right to tell them what they need. And that's done and over. And the entire sector needs to change. You know, it has to stop. And so we have to stop and listen and start from there. That has to be the beginning place and it has to be authentic engagement. It cannot be somebody was allowed to give three minutes of talking points at a press conference, but then I don't spend any money actually you know, supporting those initiatives or that community or what they said was important. It has to be holistic, it has to be measurable, not just uh, tokenism, I would say as well, which is really vital. And that happens a lot in my sector, in international development. Oh, well, we had somebody come and talk at the announcement at the UN. That's great, but if that money wasn't, wasn't actually spent and you're not listening to the community and it's not having impact for the community, that is just set dressing and that's gotta stop. So it has to be authentic work with the community. It has to start there. So in, in the political aspect, uh, we're going through that experience and journey right now with uh, am I an Obama Democrat or a Bernie Democrat or a Hillary Democrat in these different ways, right? And there's a difference between the goal and the objective to the question. How do you get people mobilized for goal to be more part of the process, right? It's exciting that more people want to be part of the process. But then I also then ask people, well, how do you want to be engaged and what's the win? You know, how are we measuring change? You know, are there going to be more young people that run for office? Are more young people going to go and knock on doors? Are more young people going to be, like, what are we doing to move that needle, right? Because the, the reality is, if we just treat things in absolutes, we're not going to have measurable progress in that way. And so, in many ways, I think the next two years, and quite frankly, the next three and a half years are so critical around this broader conversation of where we go as a country, right? Like, what are we doing to get people engaged in the process consistently, you know? We talk about how technology impacts lives, you know, we talked about that earlier. Well, 2020 is not just another presidential year, it's not just another year for Congress, it's the census and redistricting, mm -hmm. right? And it's the understanding that in this environment where people are terrified yeah. to open up their doors because an ice raid may mm -hmm. be happening, right? And now you're saying, well, you want me to tell you who's in my house? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so if people are not a part of movement building now, what then happens then? You're gonna have then undercounting that happens in 2020. That means you then lose congressional districts and you lose funding for your mm -hmm. communities. All these different Im impacts. So what I say is, okay, yes, I want the, the swing lefts and the flippables and our revolutions and everybody. I want everybody in the game, everybody in the game, right? But we have to be clear about what are the objectives we're trying to accomplish right now. Because if we keep dividing up each other in this manner, then we're gonna lose the greater good of being able to move the needle in that way. And so the, the last piece on that in terms of the, the goals and objectives, I think a lot of times we're reluctant to create the objective because we're reluctant to be held accountable, mm -hmm. right? And, and if you want to really be a part of a movement and have long-term impact, you got to be able to be ready to be held accountable. You know, I tell people all the time, they're like, well, you know, someone might run in, in different races, different things like that. I'm held accountable every two years. People will decide, did, what did you do to help me? And I want to be able to give them that answer. Or I want to be able to say, I, we did something to help them uh, in a measurable way, not just, well, I just showed up for your event one time. No, mm -hmm. no. People want to know, did you help my life? Uh, and so, the, the, the long-term build is this moment right now. How do we turn crisis into opportunity? You know, how do you turn challenge and frustration into motivation and something positive? You know, you know, when you think about what, what, what we can do, that's, that's our responsibility. Please join me in thanking Assemblyman Blake and me. Now stay tuned for a few more minutes to hear what Resistance School has in store for you in gearing up for semester two. Thank you both for that incredibly interesting and lively discussion. I know I learned a lot listening to you and I'm sure everyone else did here as well. Tonight, Assemblyman Blake led us through the landscape and history of progressive organizing. He taught us the importance of building effective coalitions 
and he showed us how each of us can start to begin real and lasting change, building on our unique expertise and our unique identities. I know we all have a lot to think about going into the summer. We have achieved so much this past month. Some of you are already organizing in your communities, while others of you are now beginning to think about how you can begin impacting things. We've heard from teachers who are starting to input our trainings into their curricula, and we've heard from others who are beginning to use our speaker advocacy tips to push their local policymakers for real, better, more responsive policy. And no matter where you are in your individual journey, we want to hear from you. We're going to be using the next few coming weeks here in Resistance School to reach out to the whole community to really find out what worked and also what didn't work for you this past semester. Your stories are helping us learn how we can better deliver trainings to support you in your organizing efforts going forward. And we'll also be using what we hear from you to design the next semester of the Resistance School. As you heard earlier, we are not closing our doors. There's a second semester coming. We are very excited and we hope you're all really excited too. We don't have many details yet to share about the second semester, but make sure you've signed up for our email list and you can hear more from that. In the meantime, we'll be using our email list to send you bonus content trainings and resources to guide you in your next steps and help you really gear up for our next semester. And on that note, we have one final homework assignment for the semester. <laughs> yes, always. Based on the work you've done and all the learning you've had through the last four sessions, our teaching team has created an organizing kit. That'll help you to guide your next steps in affecting change on the issues and the elections that you really care about. And you can check that out on our website. Finally, on behalf of all of us here at the Resistance School, thank you all so much. You have all made the past month so much more extraordinary than we could have imagined when we were starting out. And we are so excited to see you all again very soon. Onward. <laughs>